Afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to our last lightning talk of the week. Have you guys been having fun? Yeah. Um, we're really excited today and really honored to have Ray Anamoto, the VP and CCO of AKQA. Um, Ray's here to talk to us with um, some of the Future Lions winners. Future Lions is a partnership with AKQA, Google, and Can Lions. And today we're really going to explore um, some, of the, some of the winners. Um, and Ray's going to give us his opinion on why these guys will be the trailblazers that we really need to look out for next year. Over to you, Ray. Thank you. How's it going, guys? I really appreciate uh, on this really sunny, fine day to uh, come to uh, come to Google Sandbox. Um, I heard that, that there was probably about 5,000 people um, as of Tuesday, so uh, it must be uh, at least three times as many people who uh, came to the Sandbox uh, in, in, the, uh, in the week of Cannes. So um, just to give you some background about uh, Did anybody see that inflated lion? You might recognize we, we tried to change him up a little bit each year. So to this year was a very fluffy, uh, more realistic rendition of the, uh, the future lion. <coughs> um, I'm a Ray Nomoto Chief Creative Officer of, uh, of AKQA. Uh, James Hilton, who's not here today, uh, but uh, he was the uh, co-presenter when we presented the, uh, the presentation on Wednesday. And to give you some background about uh, the Future Lions, it was an opportunity that we had with Can uh, about nine years ago. They were kind enough to give us a slot nine years ago to do a seminar. And there were a couple of things that we uh, didn't want to do, and there were a couple of things that we wanted to do. The thing that we didn't want to do was that we didn't want to necessarily talk about trends and what's happening today, what's happening, uh, what happened yesterday. Uh, the timely topics, uh, those kind of things you know, tend to get talked about a lot at uh, a CAN, so that we didn't want to be uh, a repeat of other presentations that you may have seen. Um, the second thing that we didn't want was that um, uh, I think there's a fundamental dilemma with award shows and festivals, not necessarily CAN or just CAN, but other um, conferences and events, is that these award shows are fundamentally about the past, right? Uh, you're looking at the work that was produced in the past 12, 6, 12, 18 months or so. So no matter how you slice it, what we are doing is that we are celebrating the past. There's nothing wrong with recognizing and celebrating the past, but it is about the past. So that's uh, another thing that we didn't want it. Uh, we didn't want this to be uh, about the, the past. Uh, instead, we wanted this to be about the future, right? Uh, a lot of things that we believe in is about the future innovation. And I think the reason why we decided to partner with Google this past year is that Google is one of the few companies that are actually inventing the future today. The other thing that we wanted to make sure that we were able to do was that we wanted this seminar, this presentation to be about, um, as, as I call uh, the underdogs. You know, people who are not celebrated on a daily basis, people who are not yet recognized. Uh, on a national or global stage, and you know, when I uh, when I joined AKQA, that was one of the main reasons uh, that uh, that I joined AKQA. That uh, the AKQA was an underdog, and I still like to believe that we are an underdog. 
So those two things, when you combine uh, the future and an underdogs, the theme of future lions uh, emerged uh, rather, uh, rather naturally. So we wanted to create an opportunity for students to create the future. That's what, it's, uh, what the future lion is about. As you see here, we came up with this brief uh, almost 10 years ago. And I think the thing that we liked about this brief is that it doesn't have to change. It's always relevant. Connect an audience for a product or service from a brand of your choosing in a way not possible five years ago. That five year time period, uh, we felt is a good enough time period for new things to happen, new things to emerge. And when you think about the future, when you think about these things that have become available in the past five years, that I think is one way that we think we can push innovation uh, and uh, the industry forward. As I mentioned, we've been doing this for 10 years, uh, almost 10 years, nine years now this year. Uh, these are a few different renditions of uh, Future Lion character that we've created over the past uh, five years, four years, five years. It's like the, um, the Batman logo. You know, if you see the Batman logo, it's, you, know, you recognize it as a logo, but it always changes every few years. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody? Thank you. <laughs> Any Batman fans? We've had 40 plus uh, countries participating. The first year when we did this in 2005, we've had entries uh, from two countries. Uh, we've had 32 entries. I think 25, 26 of them are from the US, and maybe about six or seven of them were from the UK. Now, nine years on, we've been fortunate enough to reach um, uh, 40 plus countries. I think it was 41 or 42 countries this year. And uh, we had about, uh, we had precisely 1,760 uh, participants this year. So it's a mass, it's, it has become a, a massive uh, platform for us, definitely. To give you a little bit of insight in terms of where these, uh, these come from, and I think you can uh, see where the creativities, uh, creativity and innovation are happening around the world. Uh, US has the, the largest number of entries about, uh, with about th uh, 300, uh, 315 entries. From uh, number, spot number two all the way to, say, uh, spot number eight or so, the amount of entries, the differences between the number of entries um, uh, aren't so big. So UK, uh, 72, uh, Brazil, 69, Sweden, 64, 65, on, and so forth. And a couple of things that I would mention is that um, although Sweden you know, is number four in terms of the number of entries, um, I would point out that the Sweden had the uh, the the, the most number of uh, shortlist uh, 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 entries. So what that means is that although the, the amount is less, the quality is higher. So if you guys play in the, the world, uh, world Cup of Creativity, you guys will be champions. <laughs> and then other countries like you know South Korea, uh, Vietnam, Japan, Spain, other countries are also coming up uh, in the last uh, couple of years or so. So to quickly put some context about the last five years, and you know, when I was putting this together, it was mesmer mes mesmerizing and fascinating to realize how much have happened uh, in the last five years. The five year span isn't, you know, isn't a huge uh, amount of time, but in the world that we live in, things have drastically uh, changed. So in 2000, uh, this is 2009, Foursquare launched, uh, I believe, at uh, South by Southwest, March of 2009. Uh, the same year, Kickstarter was this uh, you know, crowd uh, uh, funding platform that launched. Uh, it's to fund creativity. The product that you see uh, on top actually isn't something that was uh, started in 2009, uh, but it was um, this Pebble product uh, was something that was funded through Kickstarter. And to this day, this remains to be the most successful uh, funding campaign that Kickstarter hosted with over $10 million that people donated to, uh, or to, to, uh, to fund this product. 2010, it's unbelievable to, to realize that it's less than four years. So it was January of 2010 that Steve Jobs announced at the, uh, the conference the, the arrival of, uh, of the iPad. And uh, in April 2010 uh, is when the product actually launched. So in less than four years, four years iPad. And you know, iPad uh, has been the fastest growing, fastest selling uh, consumer electronics device in history. 
four years ago. 2011 um, is the, uh, the launch of Uber. So Uber, although it's, it may not be in many countries, in, in about, I think, the two or three dozen uh, cities, it's fundamentally uh, challenging uh, the way you know, car companies and the taxi uh, industries uh, operate. And it's probably, I think um, I read that um, June of 2014, they were valued at $18 billion. And I don't even know what the fuck that means, but it sounds pretty impressive, right? In four years, or th actually three years. Also, they, uh, the same year, 2011, it was the first year publicly the machine beat human beings on Jeopardy. Right. So what he says, so Watson, IBM Watson, this was a, an artificial intelligent uh, machine that uh, IBM created, won a million dollars against, these are actually the past Jeopardy champions, so they are supposedly the best Jeopardy players, yet, you know, $200,000, $300,000, and a million dollars. They seem a little too, ha uh, too happy for people who lost. Uh, 2012 uh, was the launch of Nest. Do you guys have Nest in Europe? No, not yet? Kind of? Yeah, yeah. So Nest uh, launched a couple years ago. Um, I think what's brilliant about Nest is that it's not really a, a new invention, right? Uh, thermostat has been around uh, for many, many decades, 50, 60, 70 years or so. And what I think is amazing about something like Nest is that they took an old product and reinterpreted it slightly and made it conscious. Right, so it has pretty much the same form factor. The way you use it is quite similar to the way you would use old uh, thermostats, but just by reinterpreting it, uh, it becomes a drastically different and drastically smarter product. So that's Nest uh, a couple years ago. And uh, also at the same time, I think April of 2012 uh, was when uh, Sergey Brin stood on stage to demo Google Glass publicly uh, to, uh, to demo the, the power of this product that doesn't really have any direct interface that, uh, that you, are, you are using. January of 2013, so that's, uh, that's last year, uh, ESA, European Space Agency, announced a partnership with uh, Fosters and Partners. Fosters and Partners, uh, Norman Foster is a, a legendary architect in, uh, in, in the Britain, and Foster and Partners uh, partnered with ESA to design a space station that will be printed, not built, but printed with a 3D printer on the moon. Make sense? Yeah? Amazing, right? Oh, by the way, so last year, I think uh, one of the most amazing inventions of last year was 3D printed pizza that you can eat. True, yes, yes. I haven't eaten yet, so I don't know how it tastes, but I have seen a video of people eating a 3D printed pizza. pizza. All right, so just wanted to uh, dive deeper into this year's uh, uh, winners. So as I mentioned, you know, we had over 1,700 uh, participants from over uh, 40, uh, 40 countries that we had. And then the process that we go through um, is as follows. It's actually quite similar to the way we would judge a can. So over 1,700 uh, uh, participants, what we do is that we take about uh, 30 of our uh, AKQA people. Some of them are creative people, some of them are technology people, some of them are strategy people, UX people. We make sure that it's not all creative types, it's different types of people that are looking at the work. And then we group them into smaller groups to narrow from 1,700 to, uh, to 100, right? So the 100 entries are the, uh, the, the short list. And what we do um, from there is we have a group called Future Lions Council, which consists of uh, people like myself, uh, James, and other uh, executive creative directors of AKQA uh, globally, uh, as well as technical directors, including uh, CTO uh, Ben Jones. Plus, we had uh, five very, very senior executives from, uh, from Google. Uh, people like Torsten, who is the, uh, the managing director of marketing at Google Europe. So he uh, is probably one of the most influential uh, people uh, in Europe right now. Uh, ben Marbon, another managing director. Um, um, Marvin Chow, he's also the, the marketing director of Google Plus. So all these people, five people from uh, Google and probably about uh, 13 people from AKQA looking at those 100 pieces. And we narrow down to 20 finalists. Uh, and then from 20 finals, we re, re review, we re look at those uh, uh, pieces, and then we uh, 
uh, agree, disagree, debate, fight, and, and whatnot. And we chose those five uh, winners that, uh, that we are very, very proud and happy to present as the 2014 Future Lions winners. So the first one is called uh, Donate by Update um, for Apple and Product Red. Does anybody have a product that's, uh, that's from Red? Anybody? A couple of people? So um, one of the fundamental, I think you know, the Product Red initiative has been touted as one of the, the, the best charity uh, activities. The challenge is though, is that once you buy a physical product like uh, uh, an iPad or you know, other types of things that other companies make that are in partnership with uh, Product Red, um, once you have the product, you, know, it's, you don't need another one. And I've spoken to the Product Red people and the challenge was you know, how do you make it something that's not physical? So this product um, uh, or this uh, idea I think did a really, really clever thing, it's very simple clever thing to make it available to a much, much wider range of people. When you buy Product Red merchandise, Apple donates a small amount of the purchase price to the Global Fund to Fight AIDS in Africa. You can support Product Red by choosing some of the amazing Apple hardware products Apple has to offer, such as the Apple iPad, iPhone, iPod Touch, Nano, and Shuffle. But why should you buy another Apple Product Red when most of us already own Apple merchandise? So we were thinking, what about the world's most amazing mobile operating system, iOS 7? That's why we are introducing Donate by Update. On December 1st, 2014, World AIDS Day, we're introducing a small update for Apple devices that can change the lives of people dealing with AIDS forever. The update costs 99 cents, and you choose whether you do the update or not. The update lasts 24 hours, and when you donate, your device will change into a Product Red supported device. millions of users on iOS, we can make a big difference with a tiny small update. Donate by update. So uh, Tim and Bastian are here. If you can, uh, if you can uh, give a, a few round of applause. <laughs> Woo. So next one, uh, Heart Me. There's this quote, there's this prediction uh, by a guy named Vinod Koshla, who says 80% of all doctors will be replaced by machines in the next 10 to 15 years, right? I think um, the, 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 the world, the industry of medicine uh, is moving into, um, from healthcare to well care. It's less about trying to fix things that are broken uh, to, uh, to things that are, you know, to, well, you know, to maintain uh, your body well. So that's 80% uh, of doctors will be replaced with machines by Vinod Koshla. And the next idea, uh, hard me. That's me, Sam. I am five years old. I love playing with my friends and running around, like all kids do. But the truth is, most of the time I only watch the others play because my parents are constantly worried about me. Why? Because I was born with a heart defect. That makes me one out of over one million children around the world born with a heart abnormality. Sadly, heart disease in children is the leading cause of young children death, accounting for more than 30%. I don't like this topic. I just want to play. I know that my parents suffer and are constantly running behind me to make sure I don't over-exercise while playing, and soon I will be going to school. They can't come with me. Luckily, the Children's Heart Foundation came up with the project Heart Me that could help me and so many other children and their parents. Heart Me is a wearable technology that measures the work of my heart 24 hours every day, all week long. It's a normal undershirt that works as a mobile ECG, so I don't need to go to checkups all the time anymore. The fabric of the shirt is 100% cotton. What's so special about it is the part around the heart. It's a different material called nanofiber that measures the electrical signals of my heart and sends them via Wi-Fi to the smartphone of my parents and to a medical cloud of the Children's Heart Foundation where the data gets collected and used for heart research. 
As the data of my heart gets constantly measured and evaluated, my parents can monitor my heart in real time and they even get a message from the app when my heart is not so well, even when I am asleep or when I need my medication. Because all the data is collected in the big cloud together with the data of other kids' hearts, the app knows when my heart is at great risk. Then it calls my parents and connects them automatically to the heart clinic, where a doctor will help them. Okay, I have to go now. My friends are waiting outside for me. So Anne and Nicole, give it up. This one, IBM Passion is Power, it's quite timely because uh, it's an idea for the, the World Cup. It would have been cool if it was done, but it, it's still possible for perhaps the, uh, the Olympics. So. There are 1.4 million people living in the slums of Rio de Janeiro. Two thirds of them don't have the money to access reliable electricity. Every day they take energy from the electricity grid hanging above and store it on car batteries. They risk their lives to light up their homes. In the 2014 World Cup, 3.5 million people are expected to fill 12 stadiums in Brazil. That's where IBM can help. Introducing Passion is Power. By using vibrational energy sheets and placing them on the stadium floors, the power set in motion by fans become clean and efficient energy for the favelas. Using the vibrations of a single step, the floor mat generates enough energy to power a light bulb for a second. If 80,000 fans took just a single step, we could power 211 car batteries. And 80,000 fans jumping, dancing, and cheering throughout 32 games will be enough for IBM to power the favelas in Rio right until the Olympics start in two years. By converting fans' passion into tangible energy for those who really need it, IBM is delivering on its promise. So Adam and Matthias. Guru gesture. Um, one thing that, that I thought was really interesting about this is that it's sort of suggesting the next evolution of uh, interface. And if you look at you know, how the interface has evolved in the past 20 years or so, it's gone from something that you would read to watch to touch. Uh, the next evolution of interface is something like this, where you use gesture. gestures, a natural part of human communication. They can be used to express emotions, good, bad, hate or love. They enhance our conversations and create stronger bonds between people. For a lot of people though, gestures are not just a tool, but a must. Google's philosophy is that information needs to cross all borders, regardless of language, already proving this with services like Google Translate. With the technologies available today, how can Google enable communication between those who use sign language and those who don't? Say hello to Google Gesture, a service that translates sign language into speech. Using electromyography, it analyzes the position and muscle activity in both your hand and forearm. This means that Google Gesture can identify exactly which sign you are making. The information is then sent to the Google Gesture application, which translates your gestures into speech in real time. With Google Gesture, Google continues to do what they do best. Making information available for everyone. No matter who you are. Where you are 
or what language you use. So David, Ludwig, and August. Uh, Torsten from, uh, from Google was telling us that you can actually do this without those uh, wristbands, possibly with Google Glass. It can recognize your hand gestures, and that can do pretty much uh, the same thing that, uh, that I was doing. And I think these boys already might have a job at Google. All right, do zero for climate change. Uh, I think what was great about this one is that it was tackling one of the biggest issues that the human race uh, faces, which is uh, climate change or cli uh, global warming. And you know, it is something that we don't think that individuals can make a difference, but this made it so tangible and this made it so on brand uh, for Ben & Jerry's. The idea of Ben & Jerry's is rumored to be sprung out of a munchie spree back in 1973. Today, they are a huge global company, but they still want to hold on to the values of those dizzy days of the 70s. What would be a relevant way for a hippie ice cream company to do that? Well, this. Soul search, I mean research, shows that a majority of the population of New York has a temperature way too cold in their freezers. To get the most tasty taste out of your ice cream, you only need zero degrees Fahrenheit. The same goes for food preserving. Despite that, many freezers go as far down as minus 40. Furthermore, for every degree below zero Fahrenheit, your power consumption increases by 2%. In addition to that, many freezers don't even have a thermometer. They only have a switch that goes from one to five. So we figured we might help and encourage the people of New York to turn the heat up on their freezers, to turn down the heat of the environment. Presenting the rally-friendly campaign, do zero for climate change. The campaign starts by giving the ice cream boxes a redesign to spread our message. Also, we attach a specially designed Ben & Jerry sticker thermometer to every box for the consumers to put up in their freezers. That way, they can adjust the temperature in their freezers to the perfect number. By doing this, the New Yorkers get to enjoy a tastier ice cream, a lower electricity bill, and they show the world how easy it can be to save the environment. So, don't do nothing. Do zero for climate change. So, Fabian, Pierre, Afsin, Sebastian, and Linda. So, um, that's it for Future Lions uh, for this year. And you know, it is an initiative that we've done for nine years, and you know, next year is going to be our 10th year anniversary. Uh, so definitely looking forward to seeing you guys next year here. Thank you.